Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're going to get started in just a moment here, uh, but uh, first I want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, this is our first webinar in what will be a series. Uh, and so uh, it's a new platform and uh, we're expecting there to be some technical glitches. And so I'm hoping that you can bear with us while we sort them out if anything pops up. If you do experience any problems, please let us know in the chat and we'll do everything that we can to get those resolved for you. Um, if you have questions for the panel, please use the app to send the questions in or you can let us know in chat. And if we have time at the end, I'll pick the best questions and uh, we'll ask the panel and get their answers. Um, also, after the uh, webinar is over, I'll be sending out a link with a survey. Um, please take the time to fill out the survey and let us know what you thought. Uh, it would be really important to us to, uh, to help us gauge what we want to do in the future and how we want to move ahead with this. So. Thank you again for joining us, and now I'll send it over to Rick for analytics, what the leaders are doing in 2016. Rick, it's all you. Reprise of what the, we've done in the past, uh, back at Internext in uh, January. Uh, we had a very well-attended uh, live event there uh, at that conference, and uh, we've decided to bring it international and go live with it uh, on the Internet. And uh, as Buddy said, uh, we look forward to your feedback, so please feel free to jump on the chat window if you have questions. Uh, and uh, with that, let's get started. Fortunately, I have a very good panel with us uh, today, uh, and I'd like to uh, just go around the panel real quickly and allow uh, them to introduce themselves. First, we have uh, Carl Brookhart. Uh, Carl is uh, VP of Marketing for Kink. And uh, Carl, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my name is Carl Brookhart, uh, VP of Marketing at Kink. I uh, handle all the, the marketing, the BI, uh, analytics, uh, web experience, so on and so forth. And this is my first time in adult. Uh, previously, I was doing the same thing for Virgin America and EA Sports and some other companies in the recent past. Um, I think my passion really lies in being able to take that the back end and analytics data and inform the marketing platforms near real time so that we can make um, the, the right um, actions on the data that we that we collect. Excellent. Thank you so much, Carl. And uh, also joining us today is uh, Thomas uh, Skalhelen. Uh, Thomas is from Plugrush. Uh, Thomas, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas Gowlen, um, Chief Brand Officer here at Plugrush. Um, Plugrush is an advertising network or traffic network. We have like 2 billion ad impressions a day. Um, I'm really passionate about analytics. Not too long ago we implemented a new tool that some of you hopefully are familiar with. It's called Tableau and I'm kind of here at the panel. I'm looking forward to sharing my experience and kind of what we are focusing on here in 2016 for analytics in, uh, in Plugrush. Nice. So, yeah, really looking forward to being on this panel. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, also, we have joining us from Vendo is uh, Terry Arondo. Uh, Terry, let me allow you to introduce yourself. Thank you, Rick. Um, and hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Terry Arondo. I'm a managing director of Vendo. Uh, we call ourselves the only biller that earns its fee. And uh, we do that by applying artificial intelligence to grow our client revenue uh, above our billing fees. And uh, our focus is dynamic pricing. Excellent, Terry. Thank you so much for that. I ought to introduce myself. My name is uh, Rick Pector. Uh, I work for MicroStrategy. We're a business intelligence company, uh, and uh, we work with Fortune 5,000, Fortune 1,000, Fortune 500 customers on analyzing their data. Um, I'm very pleased to be associated with Vendo and the dynamic work that they're doing in uh, delivering live uh, and and uh, you know, optimized pricing to to their customers. In fact, that's why we're here today. We're here to talk about how fast analytics is changing the market in general. Uh, the internet uh, has always been a leader in e-commerce and capturing data on the fly. But I, I think really in 2016, we're seeing an inflection point where everybody is used to big data these days. Everybody's collecting a lot of uh, information on transactions and what goes on. It's the companies that are able to take that information and use it to their advantage. And in particular, what we're going to talk about today is how you can dynamically adjust the price of your, your product and your offering 
uh, to suit your market demands and, and really maximize the ability to uh, the reach of your products and to generate uh, uh, you know, better revenue and better profits for your organization. Um, analytics is really changing the way most organizations do business. Uh, there's a lot of examples in the mainstream um, about you know who he who has the the most data wins. Uh, I'll almost argue that it's a bit cultural that people these days have access to the data, but unless you have tools and the people who know how to use those tools, you're not going to be able to take advantage of the data that you collect in your environment. And so we're going to take the uh, the next hour or so to go through some topics in this area. And uh, you know, start basically focused on three areas. First of all, we'll talk about dynamic pricing, and you know, what is it, and and, and how it's done, and, and get feedback from our from our panel on that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and some of the technology behind the process. And then finally, uh, we'll talk about decision support tools and how you can enable your organization to take advantage of uh, of, of the data that you have and and run your business run your business better. And so, you know, with that, I'd like to, you know, kick off our discussion a little bit in talking about dynamic pricing. Um, you, when we look at the market, dynamic pricing is everywhere. Uh, you, you may not notice it as much, uh, especially when you're used to seeing maybe things stamped with a price tag at the at the market. Um, but if you look online, uh, from from uh, from airline tickets to uh, show tickets. Uh, you can see a wide variety of, of pricing options available, especially as we get into more commodity type pricing. You can see variations, you know, as much as 50% higher and lower. And so, one of the ways that uh, an organization can take advantage of dynamic pricing is to make sure they're presenting the right pricing opportunity at the right time. And you know, maybe to kick that off, we can uh, kick it over to you, Carl. I know you have experience when you were at Virgin in, in, in doing dynamic pricing in the airline industry. Maybe you could take us through a little bit of your experience with that. Yeah, absolutely. So the airline industry is, is um, really interesting when it comes to pricing. And, and you think about um, the nature of a consumer and the differences between a consumer that's searching for leisure versus business. And so um, even ourselves, when, we, when we're getting ready to book something for, for business, um, I have a certain range that I go for, and I know that I'm willing to go a little higher because it's a business, you know, you're flying, you're going to be working, and, and so on and so forth, versus if I'm flying with my family to Hawaii, um, I want to pay the least amount as possible because it's, you know, coming out of my pocket. So when I was at Virgin America, we started putting, uh, pulling all that data together, and, and they had a separate team that would manage all the, the, the pricing, but what would, what would happen is that team would have that technology and it wasn't uh, really available for the marketing team to utilize that. And when I was there, we started building out an infrastructure where it would almost allow us near real time <clears throat> based on many factors. And if you, again, if you think about the complexity of an airline, when you say we fly to Boston, you know, it sounds very just general, but when you think about, you know, there's two flights a day on, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but there's four flights on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, it, it gets a lot more complex, and and you're 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 basing that off of yield, and you're basing it off of many different KPIs that you look at. So we were able to, um, through very manual way, be, you know, we were able to start bringing in that that pricing that we had into our marketing uh, um, platforms, and we were able to 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 increase pricing on the business side because when you know, Rick, if you have a flight that you need to go to New York and you find out that you're going to have to fly tomorrow, well, guess what? The airlines are going to be able to make the max amount of money off of you versus someone who's booking three months, uh, four months in advance. So we were able to take that and, and build cases where we were able to then extract that data from that team, the, the pricing and revenue team, put it in a flat file, and then that gave me the business case to go to the executive team to then get funding to start building the infrastructure to warehouse all of our data and build the the logic around how do we pass that data to our different platforms. And so that's great. You were able to get your IT organization kind of aligned with your business 
And uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of organizations that can be a challenge. Uh, IT kind of can serve one set of masters, yet the business tends to work with another. Um, Thomas, do you want to share any you know examples you might have from your your experience with with dynamic pricing? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, in Plugwash, uh, we don't use dynamic pricing the way like. Um, you guys are explaining it or thinking about it, but we are kind of a self-service bidding platform, so not everybody is paying the same amount for the same type of traffic that comes in. But I've been a big fan of dynamic pricing since um, I became aware of uh, how Wendo was doing this almost a year ago, and I kind of knew how it was working in a hotel and travel industry, but uh, then when you bring it over to our industry, it becomes actually even more interesting. Um, the first thing, of course, is that um, you, if you have like a members area or if you have a digital product you want to sell, uh, like either one or one time or subscription based, um, how, how do you know if you are charging the right price, right? Yeah, you can look at the competition, of course, and you can put in the same price as them, but you might be losing sales like crazy. So with dynamic pricing, I think that um, you will find the right price for the right customer and then you will learn more about the people that actually are willing to pay more for the product based on the time of the day or maybe where they are coming from. It's like A, B, C, D, E, F testing like on steroids. So there is so many factors out there that it's kind of hard to test manually, I think. I read a report here the other day that there is like 31% bigger chance that somebody will download an app for the smartphone if it's raining outside. I mean, how, how can you ever test that out, like, in <laughs> manually? If I could give you, like, weather targeting in Plug Rush, I'm sure that there are so many people that will actually buy traffic only for people that are in cities where it's raining. So I'm like, if you can actually do this somehow with your pricing as well, that would be amazing. But, um, of course, then you have the other side of it, and I've asked this, and I know probably many people have asked uh, Terry about this many times before. Will not the customer be mad if, if he finds out that he's paying too much and someone else is paying less. And I will, of course, let uh, Thierry answer that question himself. But I'm like, do you really think that the guy that is sitting next to you on the airplane or sleeping next to you in the hotel, uh, then I'm meaning the room next, not the same bed, um, <laughs> has paid the same amount of money as you did? Definitely not. So why should your customers say anything? I mean, it's, it's basic. Yes, and, and I, I would like to pass it over to Terry because I know Vendo has a lot of experience with this for a long time now. Terry, wh why don't you take us through your view of dynamic pricing and your experience with it? Yes, thank you. So today today we're doing dynamic pricing for uh, all our clients, clients like Mangeek, uh, Vivid Hustler, um, but I can tell you it hasn't been easy. I mean, um, we started with this idea of well, we started with a question, why should we price everybody the same? And, and we went back to a medieval market, so imagine that I'm in a medieval market, I have my oranges, and I'm trying to sell those oranges, and I see a customer approaching, and uh, I, I try to look how this guy is looking, how, he's, how he dresses, if he has a nice horse or not, and depending on that, I'm going to try to sell my product at a different, uh, at a different price, to max maximize my revenue, right? So, and that was five, five, 500 years ago. So the question is, why can't we do that today on internet? So I have a shop, I'm selling a product on internet, and do I have enough information from an end user to be able to segment him, to try to identify him as a unique customer, and try to offer him the right price, being the right price, the one that will make him buy, and the one that will make me more money? And, and we thought that, yes, that there was an answer to that, and that answer was uh, using the data uh, and using dynamic pricing to offer the best price to each customer. And, and we started 10 years ago with uh, very basic tools, with uh, very little data, uh, with what we call the, uh, the Big Mac index, trying to find uh, the best price per country. And uh, again, that was 10 years ago. Then we made a huge evolution we went from the Big Mac index to the, the pizza and beer index. That was a huge uh, evolution for us. So in, instead of just looking at GDP per country, we said, okay, can we correlate the price of a monthly subscription to the price of a pizza and a trial 
uh, price of a beer and see how much sh we should price everywhere depending on those prices uh, locally and we, we made a big step forward there. Then we, we started to do A-B tests so you look into a specific country and instead of you know presenting only one, one price you try to test and wait to get the, the response. So I'm testing 25, I'm testing 28, I'm testing, I'm testing 35 and then I see which one of these prices generate a higher conversion and a, a higher lifetime value. Um, then we started to bring uh, more intelligent tools. We went from A-B test to algorithms, algorithms like the multi and bandit, which is a kind of more sophisticated A-B test, where in real time uh, the algorithm will try to calculate which of the A-B-C is better and will try to send more traffic uh, to the better one so you don't have to wait until the end of the test to have a winner and you ideally uh, lose less money. Um, a lot of successes but uh, a lot of failures also during the path. And uh, we also saw, you know, when we started to see at, at country that actually the, the differences within countries were much bigger than the difference among countries. Um, let me put you, let me give you an example. So think, think about uh, Central Park, right? You're at Central Park, you're at one end of Central Park where the Apple Store is and according to the census data the average wealth there is around $125,000. You walk four kilometers to the north uh, which is less than half an hour walking and there based on the census again you will see that the average is 25000 in the same country, in the same city, in actually 50 blocks in a, in a city. So here the idea is what data can I use? How much data is available for me to make a decision? And of course wealth is one of them but as Thomas was saying we've got things like uh, day of the week and I'm sure that uh, everybody can look at, at their days and they will see that there's some days where the conversion is totally different than others and, and usually there's a pattern. In our cases Usually Wednesdays are the worst day and then you have Fridays and Saturdays probably for obvious reasons where the conversion is, is higher. Um, time of the day, I mean clearly a night local time uh, we see more conversions than at noon and then the question is can we use all this data to increase the revenue and the answer is yes. But you need the right tools and at one point you hit a, a wall which is the amount of data that you're using and at that point you have to start using uh, artificial intelligence and this is what we did uh, uh, a year ago um, and we've seen increases in revenue for our, our clients in average of 10% using this uh, artificial intelligence tool that we have built on top of our billing tool. So billing today for us is a commodity and we want to increase the revenue of our customers by using artificial intelligence and dynamic pricing. That's fantastic. In fact, uh, Terry, since you mentioned artificial intelligence, maybe it's worthwhile to dive into that just a little bit. Uh, I, I think when people hear about that, we you know we think of uh, uh, C3PO, R2D2, uh, you know, robots and things like that. Um, I tend to like to to think of it a little bit more as, a, in a way, machine learning. Probably one of the best artificial intelligence platforms these days is uh, Watson, IBM's Watson. We've seen that uh, uh, do really well on Jeopardy. Um, if you've ever watched Watson, Watson answers a lot of questions correctly, but when Watson gets it wrong, it tends to be really wrong. It went totally in the uh, in a different direction. Um, there is a uh, in the news uh, more more re recently is uh, Google is has a uh, computer paying Go, and Go is a uh, different game than chess. You cannot a computer can't go and game out every possible move. It really has to learn, and that's a little bit what these algorithms do. They are they are learning algorithms where they try to look for what has happened in the past and use that as a way to predict what might happen in the future and therefore the more cases the more information you can you can present to your system the more intelligent it should become and the better ability it should ha have to be able to learn uh, the behavior patterns of your customers in every particular market and that's where segmentation comes in because every market's different every group of customers that are different and being able to identify not only a particular marketplace in a particular time but also the nature of that customer and you know where they fit in in uh, in, in the spectrum of customers that you have 
uh, being able to do that is something that a, a human being can't possibly keep up with, but machines are excellent at. And so that's where we want to really unleash the power of machine learning and artificial intelligence to automate these decisions so they can happen very, very quickly. Um, Walmart used to have a great commercial that would show prices dropping at Walmart all the time and you would see a price tag and a few pennies would have fall off. Notice it wasn't dollars dropping off that price, uh, uh, the price tag. The reason why was Walmart was maximizing the area underneath the curve. They didn't want to keep the price too high too long, have a bunch of people you know, go elsewhere to buy that product and then have to do a steep discount. They would literally ride the supply-demand curve down as they begin to see uh, demand trail off. They'll begin to lower the price to bring demand back and maximize the area under that curve. And uh, if an organization like Walmart can do that with you know, literally hundreds of thousands of different items, I imagine what your organization can do with the dozens or you, you know, a few hundreds of products, uh, even thousands of products that you might have. It definitely is a tractable problem these days for people to solve. Um, uh, you know, Carl, let me go back to you and talk to you about your experience in, in artificial intelligence, especially combining it with your IT world and the business world. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think my first, one of my first experiences with using AI was at EA, um, which I know you're familiar with, Rick. Uh, so we, we, we weren't able to actually execute the full AI um, before I left. But what we were able to do is we, we started looking across the, the channels and across devices to understand, you know, when does someone purchase the game and how does that change their behavior? So we found a common, uh, a common login. It was a common unique identifier, uh, which was the Nucleus ID, and we were able to extract the data from a console, from your PlayStation, from your Xbox, into a data cube, and then when someone went to FIFA Online and they were playing and managing their team through FIFA Online, they were able to grab that data and extract it to the cube and put everything to that Nucleus ID. And with that, we were starting to explore the, the uh, opportunities with then getting uh, the more automation and, and the decisioning of how do we influence them. So we had people segmented into buckets of um, minnows, uh, dolphins, and whales. So minnows being really low spenders, dolphins being you know average spenders that spend a good amount of money, and then whales being you know some folks who were spending. And this is going to sound insane, but they were spending upwards of twenty, thirty thousand uh, dollars on a game. So we were able to then figure out how do we get that person from a dolphin, not so much the minnows to dolphins, but really how do we get the people from the dolphin. Uh, segment up to the whales category, and so we started building the the lifetime value. Started building all the different models that we needed to in order for us to understand it. Uh, but unfortunately, I wasn't there to actually execute on the AI piece, um, uh, so I don't have as much experience on that side um, as some of the other folks. And that's typically a challenge because the tools that are used to run the business from you know a billing point of view and the mechanics of making sure that that the you know an invoice gets sent out, the bill gets collected, the money gets transferred, and things like that, that transaction processing effort tends to go at odds of analytical processing where you have uh, deeper questions being asked. It's not uh, it, it, the analytics uh, are typically longer running versus transactions which tend to be short from a compute cycle point of view. And so uh, being able to manage the difference of that and the different silos of expertise that take place uh, you know, can be a challenge for some organizations to manage. Um, uh, Thomas, do, do you have any experience with that at, at PlugRash? Well, now we are deep into analytics uh, and the fun of it. And for the people that have uh, heard me talk about analytics before, either in Vegas or in the Vendor Mini Conference, knows that here in Plug Rush we have hired a guy for big data. And I always refer to this guy as the German. And uh, <laughs> the German is really important in Plug Rush. And also, just recently, we added um, another analytic guy uh, and big data guy. He's a British guy. Uh, so now we have a German and a British guy doing all of our analytics and it's it's really really important so uh, our goal of course is uh, in the end to take uh, less decisions based on gut feeling there is a lot of decision made on gut feeling uh, uh, in our uh, company uh, but back um, we want to back it up with real live data and um, the end goal of course is to not do any decisions at all and for everybody that has seen uh, 
let's say, uh, Steve Jobs, what Steve Jobs did, and Mark Zuckerberg still do. They wear the same clothes every day. Um, it's just because they want to have one less decision to do. Uh, because one, it's it's comfortable, and one, two, it's, it's less decision to make every day. So if we can do the same thing over in business, have one less decision to make every day, that would be perfect. In PlugRush, I think we are facing questions like, should we send Indian traffic to this offer, or should we send the Indian traffic to that offer? What offer should get the most of the traffic? Um, now, with the help of the German and the British guy, uh, the system figures this out itself. So, the offer generates the most. Uh, the offer that generates the most money, um, kind of the certain day or um, time of the day, um, will get the most traffic and so on. But uh, I think we are only in the beginning. Just like Paul said, like there's so much things to be done. I think we have kind of the head of the robot. We have probably the body of the robot. Uh, but it's not finished. We're missing arms, legs, fingers, and toes. And uh, yeah, uh, when we get this perfect, it, I think we have so much other time to focus on other stuff that needs to be done. Uh, but but it's really interesting to see. We are pretty close to to have no decision needs to be made at all. <laughs> That's fantastic. And you you actually touched on a a bit of the challenge in this area of uh, how much exploring do you do in trying to understand you know what possible responses for a given offer are there versus exploiting and finding the best offer and then you, you know you can't continually give the same offer without exploring what other possibilities might return on the other hand if you're always exploring then you're going to be giving bad offers out so you know to to some portion of your of your uh, your your customer base and so getting that balance right between exploring and exploiting uh, can be a challenge for an organization. And uh, uh, you know, Terry, do you want to talk about maybe your experience with Vendo about how to, how to optimize that? Yeah, absolutely. So f for us, artificial intelligence was the answer to a big problem that, that we, we found. Um, and for us, artificial intelligence is letting a machine take a decision that also a human could take. Right, so why are you gonna let a machine take that decision? Well, we started 10 years ago with um, a test on 150 countries and one optimal price per country. Every time we were downloaded the prices, were downloaded the results, and adjusting manually based on the results we were getting. Okay, all this could be done with with two or three guys. Then when we started to, uh, to dig into um, how much more information we could use to optimize that, that scenario, that testing, uh, we started to go, you know, not at the country level, but you know, start putting many other factors. We found ourselves that we, we found in a situation we found ourselves in a situation where there was absolutely no way a person could do that alone. This is why we needed a machine to take the decisions. So we went from some kilobytes of data per day and 150 countries to today running more than 100,000 tests a day with gigabytes of data involved in total. The only way, the only way to do these tests is with a machine. You know, defining rules that we know are not perfect, uh, testing algorithms that we know are not perfect, and our work is to, to work on these rules, to work on these algorithms, to make them better and better and better, to keep improving how the system works, how the system can segment better, can identify winners, and can get, you know, easily or 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 fast faster, the best price for each person. So really, that that was the process. We started with a you know some data with Excel sheets, like a lot of our audience will is working right now probably to a point where managing the amount of data that we have is, I mean, it's so difficult, so insane, that you need computers. And then you also, you know, that complexity is still growing. You know, at one point you have so much data that you cannot store it in one server. So what do you do? Okay, then the, the decision is, okay, we're gonna store it in different servers. Okay, now if I have a distributed data center, how I can gather all the data efficiently and try to find things in all this data that is distributed. Then you need other systems, you need a different way to manage the data, and, uh, and you know, everybody now is talking about uh, big data and about this system that allow you to manage this big amount of data. 
but big means sometimes going from country to country time of the day and wealth with only these three parameters and all their combinations suddenly the amount of data that you have is already big data meaning that there's no way a person will be able to manage it and you will need a machine to take care of it and so you bring up a really good point of how do humans kind of sip from the fire hose of information that's flowing past in an organization and um, you know, you also touch on another one of my favorite topics is uh, testing a hypothesis. Uh, usually, and and uh, I, I like the humbleness uh, evident on the panel. I think we're all pretty used to the fact that uh, we, we really do need to to not just run by our gut, but have an idea about something and then test that idea. Uh, I know that eBay, uh, you know, one of the the, the best uh, we think of it as an auction platform. I think it's about a third or almost a half of the products for sale on eBay are fixed price. Uh, those prices were set by looking at other auctions and seeing what the pricing was 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 to be done there, and it, it's not surprising that there's literally tens or hundreds of thousands of experiments being run every day on eBay data. Where organizations are trying to test the hypothesis as what price or what offer or what combination of things work out best. I think we've seen it with Facebook recently in the last year or so. We've seen Facebook uh, one they've given you not just a, uh, a, a, a there's now seven options with the with the thumbs up that you can give on something. We now see they supported emojis, so we're going to get a little bit more resolution into data. Uh, I had one of my customers say, you know, yeah, I need to find out more about that social information, um, you know, and I go, oh, so you want to know if somebody says your product's awful or awfully good? And understanding the difference of those two things takes you into an area of text analytics and national language processing. And there's another cog in the wheel that you're going to want to put there, and you're going to want to be able to test and make sure you're picking up the right sentiment on things. And so uh, the, where the rubber really meets the road is when humans can act and take this information to make decisions from it. And that's where we lead into our kind of our third topic for the day is, is talking about decision support. Uh, and allowing decision makers to trust the source of the information and be able to base decisions on that. Uh, Carl, let me, let me circle around to you again and you know, maybe talk to your experience about uh, using tools to support decisions that an organization has to make, especially when it comes to pricing. Yeah, I, I think my first uh, experience with that was with social when I was at Travelers Insurance back in 2007, 2008. Um, and it wasn't necessarily to affect pricing more than just kind of uh, getting a quick pulse check of how people were um, were talking about the brand. And I think it's funny how that's changed over time because back in 2007, 2008, um, the main focus and the, we had these three tiers, you know, three, two, and one, one being the most important call a war, a war room, get everybody involved. Um, was really just about you know what are people saying about our CEO, right? To now, it doesn't really matter what people are saying really about the the CEO. It's really more about what are people saying about the experience. What are people saying about you know? At Virgin America was a perfect example. We would have these uh, these sales. This was definitely price related. We would have sales, and we trained our our consumer to to look for the sale on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and some Thursdays, right? So uh, what we would do is we had a whole set of tools, and I can't remember the name of the tools, but we had a social listening platform that would crawl all the blogs, all the social channels, um, and then we also had a couple of the tools uh, that would monitor the conversations online. And we were able, because of that, we were able to catch a, um, how do I say it in a, in a polite way, a big mess up, <laughs> a big mess up with our with our pricing, which was someone had released uh, inventory at a dollar, and so because we had the, the social listening platforms, within about 20 minutes of them releasing that, we instantly saw the conversations coming out about, oh my God, they have seats for a dollar, grab them quick, and we were able to, uh, which with an airline, you have to be really careful with the pricing because you have to honor those prices, you know. You have all the different um, uh, legal and it's a regulated industry. Entities, yep. Yeah, that are watching. You know, you know, and the fees are upwards of two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars, right? So uh, we used it in that way. Um, I I think we're just starting to figure out what we're going to do here at Kink, uh, but we definitely want to incorporate uh, that type of listening and quickly being able to. Then I think the interesting topic when we get there is going to be 
how do we quickly identify when it's a, a neutral, negative, or positive, and then how do we build rules and, uh, and rule sets around the actions? If someone says, oh my God, you know, they're, 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 char you know, they're charging X amount of dollars for this, for this channel, and then we see you know, a thousand people saying that, then we want to dynamically be able to change the price based on that and test a new, a new price point. Uh, without disrupting our whole, you know, platform that we have currently. So, right, and uh, there's always business models. There, there's there's finance people that really get kind of you know that you have to bring into the fold. You have to give them the ability to feel that there's command and control over the organization. We're really not totally unleashing everything over to some artificially intelligent robot. There always has to be a little bit of a human being in the loop, yet you don't want that human being slowing down things or delaying action when, when the proper action needs to be taken. Um, uh, Thomas, do you have any thoughts or, or you know, opinions on that? Uh, just that the thing with you need people is like the self-driving car. I still want to have some control. <laughs> uh, for yeah. the thing that Carl, uh, the thing that Carl mentioned about uh, listening to to what everybody is saying, um, it's a great tool out there. It's called Mention Mention dot com. I recommend everybody going in there and start googling their name or start searching for their name. We use this every day. Um, every time Plugwish is mentioned in a forum deep down in some threads or if Plugwish is mentioned in um, blog posts, we get uh, messages popping up um, every hour if there is tweets, if there is Facebook, everything. So we are kind of in control of it. But this is also still manually at the moment uh, for us, as Carl was saying, we, we need to figure out if it's a positive comment, it's a negative comment ourselves. Um, I think we are into to other things that we are, uh, other tools that we are using. We can mention Tableau for us. It's a really important tool. Um, we have been using now the last two years, I think. Um, it's it's kind of an expensive tool. Like it's nothing you go into without a plan. Uh, but it's really awesome when it comes to presenting data uh, so that everybody can understand it. Um, saying some to somebody in the boardroom that we are 1,200% better than yesterday is not actually giving a good picture to everyone in that room. So Tableau is connected to our database and can access all the fields uh, and information that we need. Um, the German is playing with that tool, of course. Um, the, he's dragging and dropping all the fields and different tables and actually making really useful reports and dashboards that save us a lot of time for making decisions. Um, I mean, it's like we ask questions to the database and we get answers back with a graph, a table view. We even have a world uh, map now that uh, our people at support is using when they are talking to customers. It's like, what's the volume in that country? We can easily find the country and we can pull it up. And it looks really like it's in, a, in, a, in an action movie. Uh, so it's kind of nice. Uh, personally, I can use this tool every day um, when I talk to my clients and tell them volume, CPMs, uh, where there's less competition, so maybe go into that market. Um, but it's just like, um, it's saving so much time because this is where the tech people needed to go in before, doing SQL queries manually to get me a number, and then I needed to ask him again. So. So this tool is really good. And we also have different uh, dashboards for developers, for support, for marketing, and for the CEO. Our CEO doesn't want to see special kind of numbers. <laughs> he just want to focus on the vision. Um, and uh, so we hide that for him. So yeah, basically Tableau and, and Mention. You need to unmute. Go. There we go. Thank you. Um, what you're talking about there is uh, a visual data discovery, and that is the hot topic these days. It's it's a it's a spreadsheet on steroids, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of MicroStrategy customers use Tableau. What 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 they eventually find is Tableau is great at the individual level, but when mm -hmm. you want to govern that data across your organization to make sure that when you present the number to the CEO, nothing frustrates the CEO more than having the head of marketing give you one number, the head of operations give a different number for this what's supposed to be the same thing. And so yeah. govern data discovery is the a little bit of the market micro strategy is operating in. And I think that is a bit of the de the democratization that we're seeing of data and information being put in the hands of users 
the way that you just described it, Thomas, that you can take this information and act on it very quickly, that's very empowering, and that's where you really become a data rock star in your organization when you can do those things. Uh, and Terry, I know with I know with Vindo, you you you're able to empower your your clients with this information. Do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the tools and the the type of information you you can provide your customers? Yes, and before going to the tools, I I started uh, my introduction uh, explaining a little bit you know this path of Vindo going through through that, and that it was it wasn't easy. And I want to reiterate this. So the, the idea of I'm going to do an A-B test and I'm going to make more money in the 99.9% .9 of the cases is not true. Right? There's, there's a long learning curve from the time you start deciding you know, what you're going to do with your data, identifying the data, mining the data. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that now until you get a positive lift when you compare to something, you know, and that something, this baseline is a, is another big issue. Uh, there's a long path and a lot of failures in in, in the middle. So some recommendations um, based on our experience. First, the data, right? You have everybody, all of us have a lot of data. So if you have a, if you're selling a product, when an end user is connecting to your server, there's an amazing amount of data that you can store. Our recommendation is store as much information as you can. Even if you're not going to use it right now, even if you think it's totally useless, even if you think that you will never use it, even if, if you think that it has absolutely uh, no relationship with your business, if you can, store it. Find, then second, find the right way to store it. So find good IT guys that will build the, the, the good databases, uh, that will allow you to access the data because that's another problem. At one point, you'll have so much data that even accessing the data will become a problem. We use MySQL, um, but at the point of going to a distributed uh, a model, then there's some complexities, so you really need some expertise. You need expert expertise on IT, then you also need expertise on analytics. So as Thomas did, hire this German guy or we have a French guy, <laughs> but hire somebody with that, you know, that can support you in this development. So analytics is, is a complex topic. There's, there's a lot of R&D, there's a lot of new topics. You can start with basic things, but you know, the, more you, you, the more data you have, the, the more you want to be efficient in finding you know, ways to, to get more revenue, at one point you'll get, you know, you'll hit that, that moment where you'll have to hire you know, people internally or work with companies that have this knowledge. This knowledge. And one thing to add to that, Terry, is um, agreeing on the KPIs. I think that it'd be really interesting to sit down. And I did this actually just recently. And Virgin America was a really telling, uh, I think, for me. You sit down and you ask some of the executives, what is conversion to you? And you'll get a different answer from everybody, right? So just being able to, you know, one thing that you also said that I think is super important is collecting and storing all the data. And when I first got here, I experienced that uh, when they were building our warehouse, they were building it with logic, which they shouldn't have because it was, it was literally dumping data. Um, but the KPI thing, I, I encourage everybody to actually go this week or next week and sit down with even your, your peers, just sit down and ask them, you know, what is conversion? How do you define conversion with our site? And it was funny because at Virgin America, when you, look, when you go to Virgin America, you know, when I, when, I, when I asked the question, the executive said, well, yeah, anybody who comes to our website, that's the, the beginning point, and then when they buy, that's the conversion. And I said, well, no, because they could be coming there to manage their itinerary. They could be going there to change their itinerary. They could be going there just to log into their account to see if they're a gold member. So you have to, uh, to, to subtract all those people out. So we were able to then go and define and agree uh, with the executive team what is you know, a, a good conversion that everybody will agree on. And then when you do that, when you go share the improvements, everybody understands where uh, those KPIs are, are coming from. So just wanted to add to that. I, I totally agree. Point, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and KPIs actually was my, my, my next point. And it's true, it was my next point. <laughs> I totally Perfect. agree. So with, with all this data, at one point you have to make a decision. What, what do you want to optimize? And, and let me explain you a very, uh, a very short story. So we optimize net earnings. So we want people to make more profit, OK? But that's not always the objective of everybody. So we found merchants that were more, more interested in uh, um, increasing the, the, their members' uh, amount than really the amount of money that they were making, right? So that strategy is totally uh, not aligned with what we were doing. So they were only uh, they, they wanted only to optimize conversion. We wanted to make them more money. And then when we were discussing with some merchants about, look, this strategy may negatively affect your conversion ratio, but at the end of the day, you're going to make more money. That was so a blocker for them because if you put the affiliate equation on top of that, they say, well, if you, re if you drop my conversion ratio by any percentage, all my affiliates will disappear and then I will have a big problem. So KPIs, yes, you have to clearly define what you want to optimize and ideally take into consideration as many factors that will affect you and your business. Affiliate conversion, you know, more revenue, you know, do you want to sell the company and the only thing that they're going to value is how many members you have? Well, I mean, that's a clear strategy for some people, right? And, uh, and then you need to understand that. And once you have your KPIs, you need on top of that the tools to be able to visualize the KPIs. And as uh, Thomas was saying, Tableau is, is, a, is a great tool. Uh, we use ClickView. And then on top of ClickView, we also use uh, R as a platform to play with the data, to analyze the data, to play with algorithms. because um, Tableau, ClickView are very good um, tools to visualize the data, but they're not really good tools to play with the data. And, uh, and we do that with R, which I recommend everybody to, uh, to use. It's not, um, I would say, it's not an easy tool, so you will need some expertise in statistics, you will need some background in mathematics to be able to use it, um, but it's free, it's open source, it's supported by, by a huge um, uh, community, and uh, well, for us, it's been an amazing tool. Yeah, and I, I would second that, too, that, that the ability to put simple, easy-to-use tools in the hands of people in your organization is really the key factor. Um, we talked a little bit about data discovery and the, the importance of it being governed, and I think that goes to the KPIs, the, the things an organization is going to try and optimize. If you are just trying to optimize on your click-through rate and not focusing really on conversion, then, then you're not probably focused in the right area. If you're focused only on conversion, but not necessarily on profit, then you may not be. You may be leaving money behind on the table. And so uh, there's a lot of consistency across the organization that a system can provide and allow you to really empower people on the front lines to make the right decisions with the right tools in their hand. Um, ClickTech and Tableau. Great departmental solutions. Uh, MicroStrategy, one reason why we're successful is we're able to disseminate that even to your mobile device. I, I was working with an entertainment industry uh, earlier this week. Um, if you think about what's happening in 2016 that's going to affect your industry, we have the Olympics coming this summer. We have the elections coming in the fall. Those are all going to drive people's attention elsewhere probably. How are you going to position yourself to take advantage of that? Do you have data from four years ago from those two events to see what happened? Especially with the Olympics in Brazil, uh, who knows what confluence of <laughs> factors that might bring and opportunities that might bring an organization uh, that, that otherwise might be, uh, com be seen as competition for eyeballs, but it actually may unleash an opportunity for some people to take advantage of things if they're able to identify what that situation is and, and be able to act on it. Cool. Um, we're, we're nearing the end. We have about 10 minutes left in the call. Um, I thought I'd uh, jump over to Buddy and see if we had any questions or anything that we wanted to uh, answer from uh, the audience. Yeah. It's, uh, since we've got uh, about 10 minutes, we'll just do a couple questions. Um, the first one we'll throw out to the group here. Uh, this person says that they've seen negative comments uh, when, when searching on the Internet about dynamic pricing, specifically uh, in regards to Amazon, when Amazon was first introducing dynamic pricing. And so uh, is it, they're asking, is it possible that dynamic pricing can hurt either their brand or their business? Uh, and so I'll throw that out to the group. Terry, Carl, uh, Thomas, any of you have an opinion on that, about the, the, the downside 
of, uh, of, of the perception of dynamic pricing and maybe people feeling a little bit jilted that, you know, boy, I could have had a better deal if I had just had done X, Y, Z. Yeah, maybe I can, uh, well, I can, I mean, we don't have the, the right and final answer, but I, I think it's, it's about how you present what you're doing. So it's about marketing, right? If you say, well, I'm charging more to that end user, the end user is not going to be happy. Right? So there's many ways to present dynamic pricing in a way that they will perceive it as a positive thing. So imagine that instead of presenting higher prices, you present discounts. Suddenly, it's about getting a discount. Okay, maybe I got a lower discount than somebody else, but at the end, I got a discount. Right? That would be a marketing approach that will protect the brand from you know, being in that situation where I'm overcharging my, my customers. Um, I mean, we've seen during years and years airline companies, hotels doing dynamic pricing, and I've never seen somebody complaining that I was paying more than my colleague here sitting, you know, two seats away that the guy got, you know, for whatever reason, because he was a frequent flyer, uh, he got a, a better price than I, I got for my seat. So we think that there's a good way to do it. Um, it's true that, you know, in some cases people can be annoyed if, if they find that the brand or, or the merchant did something wrong, but again, um, it's just about you know how you present it and make sure that the end user is at the end of the day satisfied. Yeah, I think I think you hit it right on the head. It's all about messaging and how you're presenting it, and um, also just making sure that your your customers understand that uh, some of these are temporary and and you know don't publicly put out on a landing page you know. Uh, Here's a price point. Here's another price. Like, don't show to everybody the different price price points, because that will give you a big, uh, I think, a, a pretty bad uh, um, backlash. But in the same token, being very transparent as much as you can, uh, that what they got was a very good deal, very special deal. And I like that approach, uh, Terry, about the discounts. I think that that's uh, that's super. That that's a great test to actually run for a lot of industries and. I think some people are are conditioned to accept that in in the travel space. We'll say, right? You know, hotels they know that they're not going to pay the same price. They know that uh, for for airlines they're not going to pay the same price. So, and same with the bottle of water. I mean, I go and I buy a bottle of water here versus in Europe, and in Europe it's a heck of a lot more money, right? So, it's just how you word it, how you spin it. And and then uh, if the person just continues to be very vocal about it, then adjusting maybe just for that one individual. Uh, but again, it's going to come down to a strategy where you're eventually conditioning your audience and your your consumer that we are going to have price fluctuations and price differences, um, and so on and so forth. Good, good. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, buddy, do we have another question? Yeah, we just got one in kind of on a follow-on from that. Uh, is, are you aware of people who try to exploit the discounts or discount offers uh, to get a better price, or do we not think that those are statistically significant? Um, so are people trying to exploit this? You know, uh, Terry, I can say from our experience, we, you know, we haven't really seen people trying to, to exploit our dynamic, dynamic pricing. It's not something that we've run across. We no, we, we haven't seen that. Uh, will we see that in the future? Maybe. I mean, would it make sense to build a tool that will find the best price in Amazon for a product? Maybe yes. Uh, maybe more and more. Uh, have we seen uh, people trying, you know, to to break the system to get uh, the best price? No, we haven't. Right. And and I think that the system at one point, you know, can take into account many factors to be. Uh, to be intelligent and not to fall in that situation where you know you will be presenting different prices to the same user uh, within a same session and and getting the end user angry and and you know having problems. Um, I mean the discount the discount approach I think is a valid is a valid model and it's an intelligent model, uh, but you have to do it right absolutely. And one comment I throw on there, there there's actually a, I, I, oh, I, I go ahead uh, Thomas I'll let you go ahead and respond. Yeah, I was just gonna put in like from from being a Norwegian and uh, and coming out with the terrorist uh, um, Big Mac index and uh, beer and pizza index. I'm kind of the one that comes <laughs> comes really bad out here in this panel because uh, everything is so expensive over here. So uh, 
but but I think the dynamic billing or dynamic um, pricing is it's not about it's not about this guy is paying twenty and this guy is paying paying ten. It's more like trying to make it as normal and the best price for for the person that is actually on there. So it makes more sense for me. Um, of course, I will always go for for the cheapest price. I, if I go to an electronic store, I will check all the other electronic stores. If I if I go to eBay, I will find a product, and then I will go to Alibaba Express to see if I can find it better from the fabric in uh, in uh, in China. But what we are talking about here is is a different kind of uh, billing and make it more natural for the guy behind the computer right there and right then. So yeah. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with uh, the listening tools because if you have a listening tool and you're able to capture, like one of the things, we, we did a simple test um, recently and uh, people were calling and saying, in the forums, I see this, right? So quickly you can tell that, that people are talking in a forum somewhere um, and you could either cut the test or you could just, you know, when people call and reference that, then you could uh, give them that price. but. Um, I think it goes back to then uh, tie or, or making sure that you have the right tools in place to capture that, uh, and then being transparent as possible. You know. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. Go ahead, Thomas. Is that then opening up a new little gap here? I like I I love to find new gaps. Like if if I then from an Indian computer always will get a better price, I can then have a new service so that I can order you a subscription because I'm from India and it's cheaper this way, that way we can have a totally new business coming out. So in a couple of years, maybe that's where we are, yeah. new business for dynamic pricing. <laughs> and uh, there's even a, a company I heard about earlier this week, uh, Paribus. They actually go and look and see what you've bought on Amazon and other places, and they'll monitor those prices for you automatically. And I think that's a little bit about where we now shift from an individual making decisions to where we have bots or and it, it just almost begins to feel like an arms race, where we're going to do games on either side to try and to try and uh, optimize our pricing and making sure we're maximizing the area under that curve. Um, what's interesting about an arms race? It's different than chess or Go or one of these other uh, artificial intelligence. There is no end. The game doesn't ever end. It's going to continue to go on. And so I think as dynamic pricing matures, and we're probably at the beginning of it, moving into other areas where we wouldn't have normally have expected it, it'll be interesting to see over time. We're talking about 2016 right now. It'll be interesting to see this discussion in 2017 and what we've learned and how things have changed uh, you know, as we go through the course of this year. So how about one more open-ended question before we go? Sounds good, buddy. So, uh, so Clay and I covered this one in uh, in the podcast, but it got asked again, and I like this one a lot. Um, how long before we see uh, artificial and in general intelligence, like what we see in the movies? So, I'd like to hear everybody's thoughts on that. Man, none of us are jumping in. Like I said, <laughs> okay, usually yeah. you're humble when you're in this area. And uh, yeah. the, the one thing I, I will say is that the human mind and the ability to, to the human mind is not infallible, but it is a remarkable in, in how it's able to combine a bunch of inputs and quickly come to a decision. And uh, I just I don't know if our software technology and the way we write code and program it and things like that is and it's still too linear to, to, to handle the complexities of the human mind. What is Although, the panel thing? Although there's, there's, um, there's, I've been reading up on, uh, I forgot who it was, but someone starting to make allows you to interact and, and get things, and, and it's really more of a feed. It's not really AI, I don't think. Uh, but, you know, I think that's the beginning of being able to see things like Minority Report type stuff where, <laughs> you know, it's all, right. you know, stuff like that. But I don't, I, don't um, I think I agree with you. I'm not sure that on a programming side that we're, we're there yet, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I think I think that artificial intelligence is here, is here to stay, and it can only improve. Um, driving a car without a driver, I mean, you know, two three years ago would have been something totally, you know, nobody would have believed. It. And now, and now you see a you know a car going there, and you know, there's nobody, there's nobody driving it. Um, and, and that's an extremely complex thing. So driving, taking into account all the environment and making sure you don't kill anybody on the road, 
I mean, it's it's a big challenge, and, and you know everybody's talking already about you know planes that will not need pilots, uh, drones okay. that fly you know without absolutely any assistance. So all all this is here, uh, and it can again it can only get more complex, uh, better decisions, better algorithms, better better tools. But I can almost guarantee that the government's going to. I mean, the first question that popped up with the the, the driverless car is, uh, um, you know, who who gets from an insurance standpoint? Who right. who is that Who's fault? Accident, right. So there's all these regulations and all these things that we're going to have to learn. Uh, through errors, um, so that's going to be interesting how the government slow th slows things down uh, so that we can understand and also put tons of the regulation around it and so on and so forth. So yeah. you always you already see that with the drones. You know, drones coming to be popular and people are flying drones in the middle of New York City. And it's like, okay, we need to regulate everything. So once you get the, all the fun stuff out, it's getting uh, regulated, and because people are scared of what's going to happen. But to say a time, I will say year 2020, uh, February the 5th. Awesome. Then we have 5 2020. We've, we've heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we're at the top of the hour, and I, I want to thank our, our panel. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Buddy, for, for uh, uh, managing uh, the event. Uh, I very much enjoyed it, and... Uh, Please keep uh, keep the communications going. You, you, the the, the Vendo uh, channel is always always available for you. And uh, again, I want to thank our panel, thank Buddy, and uh, appreciate everybody's time today. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Be on the lookout Have for the survey. Evening. To everybody Have watching at, at home, be on the lookout for the survey. And the uh, the webinar will be uh, will be live on this site, so you can come back and uh, and watch it and catch anything that you missed. Thanks again. Talk soon. <laughs>